there isn't urethral strictures in the posterior urethra. Um, given our time limitations, I focus my talk on the anterior urethra. I'm happy to uh, try and cover the posterior urethra another time, or there are other uh, speakers who can try and cover this area. Go, I think it's important to have a good basis of, of the anatomy before we get started. Uh, the bulbar urethra, so I'm going to focus again on the anterior urethra, uh, which is which is marked by the perineal membrane. So the bulbar ure bulbous urethra is surrounded by bulbous fungiosum, and it extends from the urogenital diaphragm to the penoscrotal junction. Um, it, there is a localized dilated area within the bulbar urethra called the intrabulbar fossa right here. Um, and the pendulous urethra, the urethra, is surrounded by corpora spongiosum, corpus spongiosum, as you see here, the penoscrotal junction to the external meatus. Uh, the penoscrotal junction is marked by a suspensory ligament. Um, Looking further at our anatomy, we can see the ex most external layer here is the skin, followed by the bux fascia, the tunica abogenia, the corpora spongiosum, the lamina propria, and the epithelium of the urethra. I'm sure everybody remembers all of the embryology, um, just like I do. So we just to, but just to review for for test taking purposes. The bladder trigone and the prostatic urethra to the level of the ejaculatory duct originated from the mesonephric duct. The prostatic urethra from the ejaculatory duct to the membranous urethra. And the rest of it is pretty much the urogenital sinus. But if you're going to divide that up, the prostatic urethra from the ejaculatory duct to the membranous urethra came from the pelvic portion of the urogenital sinus. And the penile urethra came from the phallic portion of the urogenital sinus. So um, you can foresee some test questions based on that. Uh, I think it's also important to remember the urethral blood supply and the urethra is very unique in this, in this regard because it has a dual blood supply. So we do a lot to the urethra, we can mobilize it extensively, we can divide it, we can sew it back together. And this is because of this unique dual blood supply. It is uh, the proximal urethra is, is, is uh, supplied from an antegrade fashion, and the distal urethra is supplied in a retrograde fashion. As I've shown you here, the internal pudendal artery first branches into a perineal and the posterior scrotal artery, uh, which is not shown on this picture. And then when it comes here, you see the penile, it, it, this, is the, this is known as the common penile artery. The common penile artery's first couple of branches are the bulbar artery, and the circumflex artery, uh, it then bifurcates into the central cavernosal artery. It's kind of um, faded out here. That's the central cavernosal artery uh, and the dorsal artery of the penis. So these guys, the bulbar artery, and these are supplying the proximal portion of your urethra. The dorsal artery of the penis is going all the way to the glands um, and arbalizing there and penetrating into the spongy tissue of the glands penis. And the glans penis has blood flow retrograde back into the corpora spongiosum. So even if you cut off the blood supply proximally, you know, as long as you have this distal blood supply, you have multiple different sources of blood of, of blood supply, so you tend to be safe. Um, similarly, the venous drainage, uh, which, which pretty much um, follows the glans uh, venous drainage. The concept of ventral and dorsal is very important for the rest of this talk. Um, it's important to understand that the dorsal side is and the ventral side are delineated based on an erect penis. So your dorsal um, part of your urethra is a part of the urethra against the corpora cavernosa. The etiology of urethral stricture disease is still poorly understood. 33% um, uh, of the anterior urethral strictures are iatrogenic. 33% are idiopathic, meaning we have no idea what caused them. About 20% can be traumatic and 15% are inflammatory. 
mostly uh, in westernized countries are idiopathic and hydrogenic from instrumentations, cystoscopies, etc. And in less uh, uh, developed areas, traumatic or infectious etiologies are more common. Very first guideline does uh, warn us that we should, when we are working up patients with a decreased urea, you decrease urinary stream, incomplete bladder emptying, dysuria, we should, after getting a post void residual, we should consider urethral stricture disease in our differential. We see older men, we tend to immediately jump to BPH, but in your, your resident clinics, if you are seeing somebody who's not getting better, please consider urethral stricture disease, consider um, performing a cystoscopy or other methods. Um, from, uh, so in this, in this uh, small observational study from years 1992 to 2000, uh, there were over, there were close to 200,000 office visits annually for urethral stricture disease. Six um, out of 100,000 emergency room visits were from urethral stricture disease and the incidence is about 0.6 to 0.9% in the general population with a peak um, incident around 55%, but it does increase over time. Um, the initial evaluation for urethral stricture disease is also in the guidelines. Um, the guidelines recommend performing a history of physical examination, urine analysis, and a combination of patient reported outcomes or measures, uroflometry, a post void residual. So here, this is just one recommendation in peak flow of less than 12 um, ml per second. So Adam, can you see this, this slide? No, unfortunately, it, that's all a uh, gray box. Okay. All right, well, I'm just gonna read it out. Then this is, uh, again, a, a poll that I tried to place, but for whatever reason, it's not showing up. Um, but in determining the anatomy of a stricture, all but the all but the following um, are useful. The first one is an MRI, second one is ultrasound, third is retrograde urethrogram, and the last one is a is, is a cystoscopy. So I, I think one person said MRI, and I'm going to I'm going to go with that. So MRI is least useful. MRI would be useful in patients when you're looking at um, urethral cancer, for instance, or if you're trying to examine the posterior urethra. But for anterior urethral stricture disease, MRI is not the most useful study, um, and that's what the guidelines say as well. The guidelines um, tell you that the clinician should. So when, when, it, when it's giving you a should statement, it means that, you know, it's level C evidence and this is testable. The clinician should use um, urethroscopy, retrograde um, a rug or retrograde urethrogram, avoiding sister urethrography or ultrasound to make a diagnosis of urethral stricture. I've shown you the image of a retrograde urethrogram here. It's important that we know how to read these. You see the pendulous urethra. You see the demarcation between the pendulous and vulva urethra, which is the penoscrotal junction. We talked about how that is a suspensory ligament. And you can see the vulva urethra with the intravulvar fossa in that area, and then the membranous urethra. Um, this is uh, the image of a retrograde urethrogram on the left, where contrast is going retrograde, and avoiding cystogram on the right, where the contrast is going antigrade. I think it's important for you to know how to perform retrograde urethrograms. I have, uh, in our in our uh, residency, after seven, eight o'clock, they didn't have any um, radiology residents. So if somebody came in with a suspected pelvic fracture or urethral injury, we had to go perform these. Um, I wasn't able to find an exact image of how I perform it, but this positioning is is exactly what I would want. So. Uh, you first lay the patient supine, then you roll him over slightly onto one hip at 45 degrees with the deep end in thigh flexed so that an oblique view of the lengthened urethra can be obtained. This is, you have to make sure that the urethra does not overlap because then it gives you a false sense of uh, either you're not able to diagnose the stricture or you're able to, or you, um, you know, get a wrong uh, idea of where the stricture is. 
In this particular picture, um, this is from a book by Dr. Brandeis. Um, he used a eight French Foley catheter and then and and uh, inserted a catheter into, into the urethral meatus and um, uh, kind of inserted about five cc's into the balloon and then injected contrast through there. Um, that's this is how I usually do it. I place a um, a small piece of gauze around the corona and then and then gently pull the uh, the urethral meatus, the penis towards me. Um, use a 60 cc catheter tip syringe with no more than 30 cc's in the syringe to um, insert contrast in. You can also use an angio cap to insert uh, if you have a bad urethral uh, medial stricture. You can use an angio cap. Instead of using um, this penis on stretch method that I've shown here, you can use rubber or uh, lead gloves. There's a lot of different ways of doing it. The point is you want to get a nice image without causing the patient too much discomfort. Make sure that they know that there's going to be some discomfort associated with it. The risk of urinary tract infection, hematuria, and contrast extravasation. Um, you also want to perform a VCUG at the same setting. So once the you can perform the VCUG from multiple different ways, uh, oftentimes I'll have patients who have suprapubic tubes and a VCUG is avoiding cystourethrogram. So you can um, essentially uh, insert contrast into the, into the bladder and have the patient void pretty much in the same position to help delineate that anatomy. Um, other ways of um, diagnosing strictures are using radiological studies, using ultrasound. This is not something I trained with, but a lot of people, my partner um, here in Garrett Warren will use it intraoperatively to delineate the amount of sp spongiofibrosis intraoperatively. Um, and, um, and um, you know, you, he has a probe in, in the operating room and he does that. Uh, there are a multitude of patient reported outcomes and surveys. Um, the only one I ever, I always, anytime I see somebody with a urethral stricture, I will always get a baseline IIEF to check if they have baseline erectile dysfunction. But there's a multitude of other patient reported outcomes down there. I will point out this one in the very bottom by Breyer, et cetera, uh, is a very comprehensive one. Uh, it's a very good one. It's under validation right now. But I can potentially see it being used in the future for um, large, you know, multi institutional studies for urethral stricture disease. Right now, I don't use any of these, um, but you're, you know, welcome to look through them and see if these are something that might be useful in your practice. Um, the guidelines speak very clearly about them, about how to approach urethral strictures when you're confronted with them in an urgent setting and in a non-urgent setting. In an urgent setting, you know, do what you got to do. You uh, either do a DDIU or a dilation or place a suprapubic catheter. But in a non-urgent setting, they really urge us to determine the length and the location of the stricture to basically stage the stricture before proceeding. They also um, introduce the concept of urethral rest. Interestingly, this was a small case series done in 2011 that recommended, you know, basically allowing the urethra to rest between four and 12 weeks before uh, imaging allows us to get the best um, idea of the length of a stricture. There aren't any other studies on this, but this is what we all use. We, we do give the urethra a good amount of rest so we can really understand where the spongiofibrosis and where the stricture starts and ends. I will tell you there's a lot of different staging methods out there. This is one of, this is a divine classification. The one on the right is a classification by ultrasound. I have never seen these being used. Um, this, I think, is again something that has potential. This is something that Turns Group is working on. It's not, it's not published yet, but um, I like what I like that it allows me to communicate about strictures based on anatomy, based on length, and based on severity. And I'm sure we can see more. We're going to see more about this, you know, in the next coming coming few um, years or, or months, based on when they decide to publish it. They are going through and. Um, uh, sort of validating it using surveys and understanding what people like and what people don't like about it right now. So uh, in a lot of treatment of urethral strictures, we look at different types of graphs and flaps. 
and the um, guidelines do have uh, an opinion about it. They have recommended that surgeons should use oral mucosa as the first choice in using grafts for urethroplasty. And like I show you in this table, um, the buccal mucosa grafts really has you know, best harvest time, best tissue availability, very favorable histology, good tissue handling, and good durability. Obviously, in times of COVID, um, I was discussing with Dr. Nikolowski, and he had made the he made a very good point about how we are ever going to be able to go back into somebody's mouth and uh, and grab more buccal mucosa. That is to be seen. The buccal mucosa graft, um, a couple of tips in, in somebody who has a very small mouth opening with a difficult mouth opening, or you're looking at a du double harvest graft, I do request nasal intubation. Not a lot of the um, anesthesiologists are comfortable doing that. So it's something I put in like my case request, um, especially if I'm looking at grafts from both sides. Uh, if you're looking at an oval graft, uh, it's for usually for one stage repairs. And I do mine on the left over here. I close every one of them. I close it with a running chromic. This is a, a part of the procedure that even junior residents can be, you know, very involved with. And I think um, start um, getting used to. And it, if there are two teams working, if, it, if a junior resident team starts getting, you know, very good at this, there are two teams working. It significantly speeds up the process of the surgery. So this is. Something I think um, it's nice if junior residents and everyone starts learning how to do. On the right, it shows you a rectangular graft, and this is in situations when you're doing a two stage urethroplasty. So we're going to go over treatments of um, of urethral of well of urethral strictures, anterior urethral strictures. I do want to tell you I've not seen that many SASP questions on these on these treatments. So I'm going to go over them. A lot of this is just for your knowledge. I don't know how much of this is necessarily tested, but I, uh, but you know, it's it's a really interesting disease process, and I think uh, it it would be really cool if you you know, if people are interested in how to treat this. So let's start from the tip and move backwards. Yeah, um, with a fossa navicularis, so meatal strictures. Uh, the guidelines tell us that you, they are comfortable with us doing a dilation. Uh, meatotomy or urethroplasty. The etiology of these strictures are idiopathic, congenital, poor hygiene, trauma, or lichen sclerosis. And the right here is a uh, is the uh, Hinman's guide on on doing a meatotomy. You make a ventral incision and you essentially sew it back from the sew back normal uh, mucosa to the edge of your meatotomy. Um, the urethral uh, strictures of the meatus can also be treated with facet cutaneous flaps and mucosal grafts. The divine flap, the machinage um, glands, tunnel flap, there's a, the Jordan flap. There's many different types of facet cutaneous flaps. I will tell you these are not being used as often. More frequently, now we're using these buccal mucosa grafts. I have to give a shout out to Dr. Nikolowski's group, who has presented a very elegant way of doing a fossa navicularis flap, uh, I'm sorry, graft, um, that they called a transurethral ventral buccal mucosa graft inlay urethroplasty that was published in 2016. A lot of people have used it and have had very good um, luck with it. Just to describe it quickly, um, once you put your retraction sutures in, you have to excise this area of, of um, urethral scar tissue and then using an appropriately a cut out buccal mucosa, you are able to, you deliver it essentially transurethrally. So you're not making most of the other techniques that we've seen here, you make, you know, counter incisions, but in this technique, you don't have to make any counter incisions, which I think is a really nice advantage. Um, and you, uh, and then you basically uh, fixate it down uh, using small like 6 um PDS that that come out through the skin, but essentially get reabsorbed over time. A video on this that I really appreciated. Uh, looking at penile um, urethral strictures, I will tell you penile urethral strictures are probably the most technically challenging. Uh, that is because of the blood supply in this area. There's a lack of spongiosal support for ventral grafts. Uh, there's risk of cordy with dorsal grafts. 
uh, lichen sclerosis that can affect this area is a very challenging disease process to deal with. Um, the meatus is often very difficult to recreate, and there's a risk of fistula formation. So of all the different types of urethral strictures, uh, this is probably the most challenging for us. Um, I want to, I want, this is a gentleman that I treated recently. I wanted just to make sure that all the residents understand the concept of what we are trying to achieve here. So this is his pan urethral stricture. This is where his meatus was. And the radiologist told me that at the narrowest, his urethral, his urethral, urethra was 1.7 millimeters. So if you look at the diameter of the urethra being 1.7 millimeters, the circumference is about five French. And my goal at this level is to make it at least 25 to 30 French. So I need to add 20, 20 millimeters into the circumference. So I basically had to take a graph that was at least two to 2.5 centimeter, I mean, uh, centimeters wide to add to this circumference so that I can make it a, um, a 25 to 30 French uh, base or circumference. Hope that made sense. This is one, you know, this again, penile strictures are tough. Okay. And um, the, this is one way of thinking about them. If you have a good urethral plate and a good meatus, um, you can do a, what's called a one stage colcarni repair, which is now becoming more and more common. Um, it is a, I, I will go over some of those details, but um, the other two options are doing a perineal urethrostomy, essentially diverting the urine and abandoning the anterior urethra or a staged repair. Uh, the perineal urethrostomy, I'll tell you, um, a lot of younger men will be, are pretty against the idea, but for people with advanced aged, a lot of comorbidities, um, anesthesia risk, quality of life, multiple prior failed repairs are aggressive lichen sclerosis or multiple fail like hypostatious repairs, for example, this is not a bad option at all. Um, and uh, in anybody who has you know, failed these repairs, something I definitely bring up and older men um, will, will sometimes definitely entertain the idea. Uh, I'm just showing you a technique to do the perineal urethrostomy. You want to create that flap that the authors here are showing. You want to um, dissect the urethra down to the bulbar urethra, right? So, and you want to take this flap and, all, and, and um, sew it down to this area of the bulbar urethra. Uh, this is uh, this is images of the stage urethroplasty. There's actually two ways of doing this. In the first stage, you can um, incise over here and you can place your buccal graft and come back in six months and then tubularize it. Alternatively, you can just create a urethral plate and come back in six months to a dorsal inlay. And what 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 I mean by that is make do this stage in, as a part of the second stage. So don't create a dorsal inlay and tubularize it as part of the second stage. Um, the one stage repairs, there are, uh, you know, there's multiple different types of flaps and grafts. This is not very high yield in your, in, um, in, in knowing exactly what each of these flaps and grafts are. But, uh, but what the guidelines do say is that the surgeon should not perform a single stage tubularized graft urethroplasty. You should not use any hair bearing skin for substitution and uh, urethroplasty. So those are things you want to remember. The ducket transverse island flap, the Orandi longitudinal flap, and the Mackinac circular flap all use all use um, penile skin. Uh, but these are really falling out of favor. Um, and more common not people are now starting to use this one stage urethra. Um, Colcarni urethroplasty. This was the original paper. Um, you, you see the incision is made mostly in the perineal area and some in the penis scrotal. You invert the, your, the, the entire penis and you can, and you have a beautiful, you have access to the entire urethra right here. Um, the graft is actually delivered uh, through the meatus like so and you lay your entire graph bed down, depending on, like I told you, I want this, this from here to here to be between 2.5 to 3 centimeters. I want the circumference of my new urethra to be about 2.5 to 3 centimeters. Um, and then you sew it back up, just like you would do for other graft repairs. 
Um, at this point, there are multiple different publications who have tried this um, this technique and are are reporting between uh, 88 to 94 percent success rate at 12 months with an 88 percent patient satisfaction. So that's really good um, good data. Finally, for bulbal urethral strictures, uh, this is the only type of stricture where the guidelines are okay or suggest that they would be okay with offering patients urethral dilations, PDIUs, or urethroplasty when you when you present with an initial bulbar stricture, which is small. This is my the first box right here on the left um, in a short bulbar stricture. And two centimeters, I will say, is sort of an arbitrary number. Um, it is kind of, you know, based on your gestalt. If you if the rug shows two centimeters, but you look in with a cystoscope and it looks like thick, dense spongiofibrosis, then I would not consider that two centimeters. I would consider that a longer stricture. In a recurrent bulbar stricture, performing an EPA or a um, or a buccal mucosa uh, augmented urethroplasty. And then anything above two centimeters, you really don't want to be offering a DVIU or a dilation. You want to go straight into your erythroplasty techniques. So talking again about the initial presentation with the bulbar stricture in a short bulbar stricture. Um, remember, this is uh, this is whether the um, uh, guidelines do suggest that it's okay to offer a dilation or DVIU. Um, the dilations can, can be performed with filiforms followers. I use Heyman curved dilators over a wire, um, uh, and or a you can use a urethrotome, either cold cut or a laser urethrotome. Um, I have uh, not in the anterior urethra, but in the posterior urethra, I have used mitomycin C as well. Um, so this this is a really well done sort of randomized prospective um, trial that was done on um, and followed patients um, uh, for to to look at DVIU the, the um, success of DVIU over time, and it shows you that uh, in strictures that are longer than two centimeters, this is really not a very fruitful procedure, and the stricture and the failure rate is extremely high. That's something you want patients to understand. This line A is in strictures less than two centimeters. Line B is strictures two to four centimeters. And this is line C, which is strictures greater than four centimeters. Um, and uh, this, this is another um, um, a Kaplan myograph that shows you that every time you do this, it increases um, the rate at which the stricture comes back. So it ha the, um, they come back faster. The other, the other one group that I would specifically recommend against doing dilations and DVIUs is patients with lichen sclerosis. These are patients where when, when you dilate them, the, um, the inflammatory nature of the disease is so aggressive that the stricture comes back faster and comes back much longer. You just have to be kind of cautious and thoughtful about that. Um, the guidelines uh, suggest that dilation and DVIU have about the same efficacy and they don't recommend one over the other. Um, so this is interesting. Uh, you know, we, we are obviously practicing in the United States and would you would be tested based on the AUA guidelines. And the AUA does recommend that um, if you have had die, if you have performed a DVI or a dilation one time, uh, and the person has failed that, they should be re they should be referred for a urethroplasty. However, in the SIU guidelines, they recommend that you can continue to repeat DVIU uh, for favorable strictures if the time to recurrence is greater than three months. Um, I think you have to um, have this discussion with the patient. You have to, you know, they need to understand that there are uh, risks and benefits to both. Um, and uh, in, in most patients that I offer something permanent that can quite significantly improve their quality of life and they don't need to see me anymore once, a, once after a successful urethroplasty, I think they do prefer that option better than the like better than better than DVIUs where they might, might need to come back in another few months to have it repeated. 
Um, this is another uh, guideline. You can, you, um, the surgeons can safely remove your urethral catheter within 72 hours, um, which is a recommendation. So I'm assuming you can't see this either, but this question says, with regards to DVIU, which of the following statements is correct? Um, strictures are best incised at 12 o'clock because of efficiency of most urethrotomes. It can be associated with erectile dysfunction. In select patients, the long-term success is over 90%, and DVIU should be the first procedure considered for any stricture of the anterior urethra. And the only correct answer there is that it is associated with erectile dysfunction. So please make sure your patients know that when you offer them a DVIU. Um, this is a really nice paper, a cost-effectiveness analysis of DVIU versus urethroplasty. And if you're looking at DVIUs with a success rate of less than 30%, 35%, urethroplasties are very, very clearly more cost effective. Um, if, you're, if, you're urethro, if your DVIU success rate is significantly higher than that, and, when, and by success you mean 12, year, 12 months with no recurrence of stricture, then, um, then you can argue otherwise. But I will also tell you, as, as somebody who sees people with after multiple DVIUs, it certainly makes the, the final urethroplasty more challenging. So if a patient is interested in urethroplasty, that's certainly something they should be offered. In recurrent bulbar urethral strictures or, or ones that are longer, this is sort of my thought process. Um, if they are traumatic and less than two centimeters, um, an end-to-end -end urethroplasty. If it's more than two centimeters, some kind of augmentation. By augmentation, I mean using a graft or a flap or something to, uh, to um, uh, help increase the size of the lumen, to augment the size of the lumen. In non-traumatic strictures, if they're distal, using a dorsal onlay buccal mucosa graft, and if they're proximal, using a ventral onlay buccal mucosa graft. And if any of these fail, using an SOPA or an inlay. This is probably this is probably you know quite um, out of uh, out of the guidelines. It's not something you're going to be you're going to be tested on. What you what you should know is um, the guideline statement that says a surgeon should offer urethroplasty as the initial treatment for patients with long bulbar urethral strictures, given the low success rate of DVIUs. Um, so in anterior urethral strictures, which are urethro, uh, in urethral strictures greater than two centimeters, um, if you looked at this data between five and 10 years back, an EPA or an excision and primary repair really was the go-to method of doing things. Uh, this was, uh, this used to be a, a technique that almost, you know, people would uh, immediately uh, resort to this technique. Um, it does, it, it typically can be used for patients with strictures between one and three centimeters, and it requires about one centimeter spatulation on the proximal and distal ends. So you have to, um, I'm gonna show you some images here, but you know, you gotta position the patient in a high dorsal lithotomy, make sure all of their, uh, all of their pressure points are padded. Um, I pad the lateral malleolus uh, very well so that the lateral co uh, compartments are, um, don't, uh, are not touching my yellow fins. In the EPA technique, um, like, I like I just described, you want to um, uh, dissect out the urethra very well. And now going back to the anatomy that we talked about earlier with the blood supply, remember that you are taking the bulbar urethra, you're taking a lot of this blood supply. So you have to ensure this patient's not had a prior hypospadias repair, for example, something that would, um, would threaten the retrogrades, you know, blood supply in this area. You want to spatulate this urethra uh, and then and sew it back together in kind of a, um, uh, a um, in a double layer closure. Um, more recently, if you so this is a a, a survey of sur of urethroplasty surgeons in ten different institutions. If you look at it, more and more, fewer and fewer people are doing EPAs. Uh, there's multiple reasons for this. Um, uh, I think there are more uh, techniques now in our armamentarium. There's uh, more techniques that are described, and our field is kind of rapidly evolving, where the EPA is kind of not as is not favored as much anymore. 
So what this graph is showing you is back in 2010, for example, if you looked at 10, 100 different, um, uh, you know, in ball body urethral strictures, about 50% of those were getting EPAs. But if you look at 2017, only about 20, oh, I'm sorry about that. Only about 20% of patients are getting EPAs. More patients are getting this non-transecting EPA, which I will talk about, a dorsal only uh, augmentation, um, augmented sort of uh, urethroplasty, a ventral only, and, uh, and an augmented dorsal only. So I'm, I'm gonna go over some of these other techniques, but you know, one thing to note is that this is something, this is a field that's rapidly evolving every year in GURS and AUA, there's new techniques being discovered, there's new techniques being, um, being described. So this is something you're going into. I would strongly recommend that you, you know, continue to keep asking for advice and keep talking to people who do this on a regular basis because um, this is changing. Now, there are some people who don't offer EPS anymore at all. Um, this is a new technique by Dr. Mundy, who's a very famous uh, reconstructive urologist out in, uh, in, uh, in London. It's called a non-transecting bulbar urethroplasty. And the idea here is to not transect that spongiosum so as to ensure that that retrograde blood flow that you're getting is not compromised. What he's showing you here is these are the corpora cavernosum. This is the corpora spongiosum in your urethra. This is a catheter, right? So he has dissected this off dorsally. So he's, he's, um, he's dissected the urethra off and made an incision right in the, on the back end of it. Um, and, and, and he's played some um, retracting sutras here. And now he's gonna close it in a, um, in a longitudinal, he opened it in a longitudinal fashion. He's gonna close it in a vertical fashion right here. Uh, so this is one of the techniques that is gaining a lot of traction. This is probably the technique that I use the most. Uh, it's a dorsal onlay, buccal mucosa graft. Um, again, this is um, showing you the uh, buccal mucosa that's kind of sitting on the corpora cavernosa, uh, cavernosa as, a, as its base. And the urethra is going to be sewn on this way uh, to close this. A ventral onlay is when you when you don't you don't dissect it posteriorly, you don't dissect it dorsally, uh, but you make an incision along the urethra and place your graft on it, and then cover it with the corpora spongiosum on the ventral side, and that is what supplies this this buccal mucosa. Um, so there are there isn't great data on dorsal versus ventral. Um, there are. Um, there is one thought process that in patients with sort of TERP related strictures that are more proximal, those are patients that would benefit more from having a ventral on list. Um, but uh, both of these should be, you know, definitely part of your armamentarium. The ventral on lay over here, like it tells you, um, it, 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 like I just said, has, you know, more um, sponge abundance, so more proximal. And um, if you, you have to remember that the ventral onlay has to get blood supply from the sponge. So in areas that are sparse on the sponge, the ventral onlay will fail. Um, so the, the AUA guidelines also uh, tell you clearly that the surgeon should not perform substitutional urethroplasties with allografts, xenografts, any kind of synthetic materials or experimental products. But I think it's important for us to know about it because patients ask these questions. This is an investigational product that um, some of my patients have been asking me about. I don't know if any of you are doing it, um, but it is a basically a urethral dilation balloon uh, with paxitaxel. Um, this is a drug coated balloon um, with paxitaxel. And this is a one year study that is performed by this group they looked at patients with bulbar strictures that are less than one centimeter, uh, that have one to three prior failed endoscopic attempts. They were um, using patients in four different sites in the Dominican Republic and Panama. They actually recommending they actually reporting seventy five percent anatomical success at twelve months, which is not not bad to be. To, you know, there is definitely I definitely have a patient population. I'm sure you do too that could benefit from something like this. So I'm curious um, as to where this, this kind of product will go. 
Um, other things that used to be around that are no longer around are this ura alone stent. Uh, this is a stent that used to be placed within the urethra. Um, in the uh, and it is completely uh, it is out of you know the manufacturers don't make it anymore and it's not something the guidelines are recommending either. However, um, the SASPs um, do uh, you know talk about the urolum stent, and I'm going to read you this question because you can't you probably can't see the screen, but this talks about a 65 year old man who underwent placement of an intraurethral stent for treatment of a recurrent bulbar urethral stricture. He has markedly decreased urinary stream three months postoperatively. Urethroscopy demonstrates obstructive tissue protruding throughout the stent. And your next step is A, balloon dilation, B, replace the stent, C, urethroplasty, D, suprapubic cystotomy, and endoscopic resection of tissue. And the SASP answer was endos um, endoscopic resection of tissue. So this is something they, they clearly still want you to know about, um, and they want you to understand how to, how to work with this. Follow up after urethroplasty or dilation. You want to monitor these um, patients to identify symptomatic recurrence um, and a DVIU and urethroplasty. I will tell patients the highest rate of recurrence for me is what within um, in, within the first year. I'll tell them um, that um, we I usually see them back in about six weeks for a Euroflow study, and sometimes uh, nowadays we're doing everything by um, Telemedicine, but usually I, I will see them back in uh, six weeks for Euroflow, and then in another another month or three months or so, depending on how concerned I am about the patient. Um, so, in conclusion, I just want us to be, just remember uh, the blood supply and the anatomy of the urethra. It has that very cool dual blood supply. Always, always get baseline erectile dysfunction data. Um, with your EPAs and erectile dysfunction and a cold glands is something that patients will report. Um, it is the rates are low, but they do happen. And if you don't ask specifically, are you having a cold glance? It's something patients may not tell you. In non-urgent settings, you want to make sure you you um, stage all urethral strictures. Uh, you want to dilate DVIU and urethroplasty only for the new short bulbar urethral strictures. I would say for the flimsy strictures, uh, not for the very dense ones. And pretty much everything else you want to refer for urethroplasty. Um, again, thank you so much for the opportunity to collaborate. Um, I appreciate it and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. That was a fantastic presentation. I have one question from the audience. Uh, any preference on use of Holmium YAG laser versus cold cut for DVIU? I generally use cold cut, but you can, uh, but you can use uh, uh, laser as well. There aren't uh, any randomized trials, or any large studies that I know of that answer that question, but it's certainly worth thinking about. Is there any uh, experience, this is Joseph from Rochester, New York, experience with respect to posterior auricular skin, which is hairless skin. You made the point about not using hair bearing skin. How about the posterior auricular area, which uh, most people are, is hairless. Any experience with that? No, I have not seen any data on that. Um, honestly, I have not looked. Um, we have such good luck with buckle graph that um, I, I don't know that there are people experimenting with other stuff, but it's certainly worth, I'm going to write that down and, and look into that. That's really interesting to think about. Yeah, so buckle and lingual graphs. So if I, if I, so I, if I need, I'm able to get about five to six centimeters from each cheek, and then I, I can get some from the lower lip. And then I can get some from below the tongue, lingual grafts. So those are my preferences in getting grafts. Uh, John, uh, this is Kevin Pranikoff from Buffalo. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, anecdotally, there were some people before the age of buccal mucosa in the past, there were some people who had um, 
commented on using uh, posterior auricular skin um, in urethroplasties. Uh, I can't recall any large papers or series on that, but it had been uh, talked about. Yes, but of course, back then we were using penile skin and it was usually um, if uh, uh, individuals ran out of penile skin or it, the penis was severely scarred um, and they needed some other area that was always talked about as an area where one could gain skin, hairless skin. In a past life, I did some work with Tony Mundy, and for pen urethral disease, there were times when he resorted to posterior skin, when everything from the lateral checks, the lips uh, are utilized, mm -hmm. that he resorted to that. So I'm just not, not sure of the recent experience uh, uh, worthwhile looking into, looking for hairless skin. Yeah, it's definitely interesting. Uh, two questions from the audience here. One was a question about should bul bulbar stricture ever undergo a dilation or incision? Yeah, so based on the guidelines, a short bulbar urethral stricture can undergo, uh, can, can, they do recommend um, you can offer patients dilations or DVIU. So for the first time, the American guidelines say they can offer an initial short bulbar urethral stricture dilation or um, um, a DVIU. The European guidelines say you can continue to offer dilation until the recurrence rate is less than three months. And a, another question um, from Dr. Kogan, he was asking, can you go back later and re-harvest buccal mucosa? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's one of the main reasons I close the cheek. Um, so there's some, there's two different schools of thought. There are some people who leave when they after they harvest buckle graft, they leave it open. And there are, and um, I was always taught to close. And one of the reasons I was taught to close was when you go back, it's um, sometimes easier to reharvest once it's closed. But um, I've also heard that if you leave it open, you can still go back and reharvest. Um, but I, that's not something I do, so I, I don't know. But that's one of the reasons I take the extra, you know, 10, 15 minutes to close it up. Question, any evidence for using trimethicone injections for dense penile stricture disease? So um, any kind of work in the penile urethra, um, we, would, we would recommend definitive treatment with urethroplasty. Um, and um, the triamcinolone injections are, use, are um, have been used for bladder neck contractures, uh, but not penile urethral work. Penile urethra is a very delicate area to work. The blood supply is fidgety, it's, it, it's tough. How long are you leaving indwelling catheters in place postoperatively after buccal mucosa onlays and for EPA? Three weeks. Three weeks, and I get a, a, retro, a peri catheter retrograde urethrogram after. Regardless of length? Regardless of length. Any more questions from the audience? Comment on experience or thoughts on uh, BXO, which uh, has been described as really uh, the vein, uh, difficult to manage as far as balanitis, zodica, obliterans, which you come with in inflammatory uh, strictures. Is, is that what were you referring to that also in that context? Yeah, exactly. I completely agree with you. It's one of the toughest disease processes in our field to um, to um, to address. I will tell you, I did not put this in, in, but the guidelines have two recommendations for us. Number one, considering biopsying the um, that those any patients that we can, that we are concerned about BXO, and number two, to never use penile skin for obvious reasons in patients with BXO. 
Um, in residency, we had we used to allow patients to dilate themselves with um, steroid coated catheters. Um, I personally, in my practice, have moved away from that and will offer them urethroplasties. And I do think um, that it, that has a little higher success rate and just a little better patient satisfaction than having to dilate over and over and over again. Um, but um, very severe VXO sometimes needs to be diverted. You just need to um, get a perineal urethrostomy and be done with it. Um, they can be these, these can be very, very difficult patients to manage. Do you have a length preference for your dorsal Heineke Michelix closures? Is that for the non transecting urethroplasties? I think that's the question. Yeah, the, I, it, it just depends on uh, the, the length of the stricture. And um, yeah, I mean, I'm, it's um, you kind of spat spatulate one centimeter above and below. Oh, whether if oh, okay, yeah, okay. So you're you're asking if the stricture is more than two centimeters, would you still offer a non-transecting? I would not. It's for short bulbar urethral strictures. Because remember, you have to be able to mobilize and get those two ends together. And so I would I would just go to a I would just go to a um I mean so it's all you're already dorsal, you have already you have everything set up for a dorsal onlay. So if if I'm not able to get those two ends together, I'll just do a dorsal only. It really is my favorite surgery. I missed the introduction. Uh, I, I do want to say that Dr. As far as Dr. Ege's introduction, she joined uh, our team in Rochester after training at Duke University for residency. And fellowship at MD Anderson in reconstruction. So thank you for this fantastic talk, Dr. AJ. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, and thank you to all the residents who are out there in our front lines. Um, you know, placing catheters and COVID patients. I thank you for doing it so that I don't have to. I really appreciate it. Thanks, everybody.